me, you've kindly made this little program. Um, I, I don't think there is um, um, mogism. I think what there is is conservatism, and that I think people want to hear a conservative message based on conservative principles, and they want to hear people talk about the benefits of Brexit and how we get there. Right. I mean, but do you have a sort of persona? It seems that you have developed one, um, you know, well-dressed, polite gentleman who might not look out of place in the 18th century. Um, you wouldn't describe yourself as a modern politician, would you? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I, I believe in uh, important principles that I think will be to the benefit of the country if implemented. Uh, I believe in um, the economic policies that come from classical economics. I believe in free trade. I believe in self-governing nations. Uh, I don't adjust my views uh, to suit the prevailing political wind. Right. So when you hear someone like Anna Soubry, your Conservative colleague, say you're not a proper Conservative, was that hurtful? No, of course it wasn't. Uh, there's a very important debate going on within the Conservative Party about Europe, and um, Anna Soubry has her very clear and honestly held views. They are not my views, but it's important that the Conservative Party remains a broad church and includes within it people who have a variety of opinions because there's no monopoly on being right and you want to develop the best political ideas. It's why it's so good that these various um, think tanks have set up in different parts of the party to come up with the ideas that the Conservative Party needs to use when in government. But she wasn't talking about Europe there, was she, Anna Soubry? She was talking about being a one nation, socially liberal, yes, and, and pro-European. And, and she said on all of those things, you're not a proper Tory, Justine Greening. Um, another colleague and former cabinet minister said she couldn't stay in a Tory party led by you. She didn't quite say that. She said it would be a stretch, but she needn't worry because I'm not going to be leading the Conservative Party. I'm backbench MP, uh, and therefore, in spite of the kind things Nadine Doris said, uh, I'm neither a runner nor a rider. Uh, but I think that uh, um, the Conservative Party has always been a broad church. So we were discussing earlier the authoritarian and the more liberal wings of the Conservative Party. And those views are properly reflected within the makeup of the parliamentary party. I'm not sure saying whether or not people uh, are proper Conservatives takes the debate very much further forward. Right, but it does raise this issue. Um, you say there's no leadership vacancy at the moment, and that's true, and that you wouldn't be a runner or a rider even if there were to be. Um, but you are the bookie's favourite uh, to be the next Tory leader. Um, you top the Conservative home list of people that they would like to see as the next Tory leader. You've agreed that much of what you think personally may be out of step with uh, modern Britain, you're against gay marriage, you're anti abortion. And you can't divorce, can you, the, the personal from the political here? Um, I think that all politicians are a complete package as to who they are. And I think that electorates have a right uh, to know as much about the people who stand for election uh, as possible so that they can form a full view. Right. And so just to be clear, since I said you, you said you wouldn't be a runner or a rider in a contest, are you ruling yourself out completely uh, if ever there were to be a leadership contest? I'm just looking at the form book that the Conservative Party in office, back to Stanley Baldwin, has always voted for one of the uh, great officers of state or a holder of the great officers. It's always been a foreign secretary, a former home secretary or a former chancellor. Uh, and that is the way it will be next time that Backbench MPs do not, when a party is in government, become the leader of the party. Right. But if pressure were to grow, if they wanted a Brexit-supporting candidate, and you are as popular as it seems um, amongst certain wings of the party, would you be able to resist running? Uh, there are many people who are very popular within the Conservative Party, and there are many people who support Brexit. There's the great Boris Johnson, there's Michael Gove, who both of whom ran last time round. Uh, so um, th th I do not have a monopoly on this, and I'm a very junior figure within the Conservative Party, so I think one must be sensible about this. Right. Um, I mean, let's just sort of put that just to one side for the moment and look at Ruth Davidson, whom mm. we talked about at the beginning of the programme. She's also talked about as a future leader of the Conservative Party, and she said that the party needs to be a little more joyful, uh, appealing to the young. Um, she's also somebody who is gay, engaged to be married, and pregnant. Do you have a problem with any of that? None of that at all. It's up to her how to lead her life, and I think it's wonderful that she's expecting a baby. That's a huge joy. I mean, as, as a father of six, I think it's very exciting when people are bringing a new life into to the world. Um, uh, uh, and I was, Ruth Davidson was on the radio, or the radio reported her saying 
But for the first 12 weeks, when she had to keep it secret, she found this incredibly difficult. And that's exactly how I've, I've always felt when my wife's been expecting children. You want to tell the whole world. It's such a wonderful uh, and joyful event. So you'd be happy to support her as leader? There isn't a vacancy, so we've got to wait but if, and if see. But if, if well, she were, she's the sort of person that would embody she, all the things that you... She is a you... formidably capable person um, and has great political skills and a wide electoral appeal. Right. But I, I'm, I'm not going to put the finger of doom on any particular candidate <laughs> at this stage. It's, it's far too dangerous a business, that. But you wouldn't support her marriage um, to the woman that she wants to marry? Th th this is a, an issue of sacramentality. Uh, the sacrament of marriage is one that is defined by the church, not by the state, uh, and the sacrament of marriage is available to a man and a woman. This is the teaching of the Catholic Church, which I accept. Right, but can you see that that, that is a problem uh, for many people? Um, if you are going to be uh, a senior politician, you already are a senior politician if you count leading uh, the ERG, the group of 60 or 70 MPs, that you hold those views about some of your colleagues um, who want to be married and are gay. I make no criticism of any of my colleagues, but do you believe in religious tolerance? I do. So why do you pick on this view of the Catholic Church? I'm, I'm just asking you. Well, I'm now asking you. Why do you pick on the views of the Catholic I'm Church not, and say I'm that you picking, can't hold these I'm in modern not, politics? I'm not saying you it's can. Exactly I'm saying that there are people who might have a problem with it. You're saying that tolerance only goes so far and that you should well, not be tolerant okay. of the teaching of the Catholic Church. So isn't is it, this stretching into religious bigotry? Except, is it a barrier, do you think, to holding high office? That's a different question, but well, that's not but the that's one you just asked. All right, well, that is really what and I meant to really say. And this is really important to get to the heart of this, because this country believes in religious tolerance. We are a very tolerant nation. And the act of tolerance is to tolerate things you don't agree with, not just ones you do agree with. And the problem with liberal tolerance is it's got to the point of only tolerating what it likes and therefore well, attacking... Well, don't assume what I think or right? that I'm, I'm attacking. I'm, I'm raising an issue your that question. your colleagues I'm have also raised. I'm just your question. And the Catholic Church of great antiquity has taught these things. And it is absolutely legitimate for Catholics in public life, in private life, to believe and accept the teaching of the Catholic Church, as it is for Muslims to believe the teachings of Islam. Uh, of course. And likewise for Anglicans, but, but also if for you, agnostics if you and wanted to hold, if you wanted to hold office, high office, or if somebody who held those views wanted to hold high office, would they be a barrier? It would be a matter for the voters to decide. But what's so important is that I should be honest with voters about my views and make no bones about the fact that I'm a practicing Catholic and I believe in the teaching of the Catholic Church. Should they be a barrier then, um, well, or should they not? I mean, if they were. I know we've just, we've just discussed, discussed it, that. but there are people within your party, um, and I've talked about Anna Subri and Justine Greening, who find those views difficult if someone was going to hold high office. They are absolutely entitled to disagree with my views and the views of the Catholic Church, but where I would quibble is that if we are a tolerant nation, you have to be tolerant of the views that you don't like as well as the ones that you do. And that, and that is fine, and that is true. But you still haven't answered the question, it's would they the, be a barrier to, to somebody holding high office in the Conservative it is Party? Up, it is up to the British voters to, to decide this. The British voter in the ballot box is entitled to vote for whomsoever he or she chooses. And I make clear to people in North East Somerset when they come to vote for me what my views are on any issues they Would you like to about. change the law on, on these issues? Um, the law is not going to be changed. But that's not my question. No, Would you like to change it, the law? But it's quite an important prelude to the discussion because the issue is actually about what society thinks. I think it is a deep, deep sadness that there are 190,000 abortions in this country in 2016. I think it is one of the great tragedies of the modern world. Uh, and I think it would be a wonderful thing if society uh, came to a different view on abortion. I do not see that happening. And I don't think changing the law when society overwhelmingly th thinks something different is going to achieve And what anything. about gay marriage? I mean, these are things... Would you like to see the law change, Jacob, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on those issues? The, the, the law on gay marriage is now the settled uh -huh. will of Parliament and is not going to change. Right. But you would like to see it not, if, you were, if you were given that... I, it's trying to get behind. I was People not, will want to know what you would do, I what was, you might do. Okay. Well, most importantly, on religious issues, these are votes of con conscience and it would be quite wrong to impose my conscience on you any more than it would be right of you but to can impose you divorce your conscience. Politi can you divorce politics from one's personal views, religious or otherwise? Well, you, you can in terms of whether they are part of formal party policy. In America, uh, the abortion issue has become effectively part of formal party policy. I think one of the strengths of our political system is that they have not become a part of party politics and that that does allow differentiation between one's theological views uh, and between one's secular views. All right.
we'll have to leave it there. The 122nd Lord Mayor of Sheffield was sworn...